Guns for General Washington. Chapter 3. The New Commander. Father and I went down to camp along with Captain Gooding, and there we saw the men and boys as thick as hasty pudding. Yankee Doodle, keep it up, Yankee Doodle Dandy. Mind the music and the step, and with the girls be handy. A ragged squad, led by a lone fifer, made its noisy way through camp. The fife shrilled and squeaked, and the men raised their voices to follow the melody. The ditty had first been sung by the British to mock the rebels, but the colonists liked the lively tune, so they added new words and made it their own. There was Captain Washington upon a slapping stallion, a giving orders to his men, I guess there were a million. Yankee Doodle, keep it up, Yankee Doodle Dandy. Mind the music and the step, and with the girls be handy. The squad on its way to gather wood marched past the camp headquarters. An officer working at his desk stopped to listen, and the song gave him a welcome lift. General Washington had been sitting and brooding. Like General Howe, his opponent aboard HMS Somerset, Washington was worried about the stalemate. But not for the same reason. Months earlier, in June of 1775, the Continental Congress had chosen him to command the new Continental Army. The delegates in Philadelphia couldn't have made a better choice. Tall, dignified, with good military experience, the Virginia landowner was a staunch patriot. When the call came, he accepted it gladly. Full of exciting plans and high hopes, he had hurried to Massachusetts by fast coach. But after a few days in Cambridge, his excitement and hopes had begun to fade. What the general found when he reached headquarters was something close to chaos. The Continental Army was a force without shape. There was no organization and no discipline. Shelters were scattered everywhere, no two alike. The men were living in tumble-down shacks, rickety lean-tos or tents patched together from scraps of canvas and blankets. Their clothes were shabby, and there were no uniforms except for a few companies funded by their wealthy officers. Washington had a neat, precise military mind. Over and over, he tried to remember that his raw troops were colonists, not professional soldiers. They were a noisy, good-humored, democratic mob. Willing and brave, but not happy taking orders. In fact, orders and royal commands were the very thing they were against. So they'd come together to put an end to King George's tyranny, this odd assortment of farmers and fishermen, carpenters and cobblers, tradesmen and teachers, barbers, blacksmiths, frontier scouts, seamen, clerks, weavers, tanners, tailors, shopkeepers, stonemasons, lumberjacks, and young men just seeking adventure. Also, the good pay of $6 a month for Army privates drew many colonials to the cause. It was the easygoing disorder of his troops that troubled General Washington, but that could be corrected. These good-natured amateurs with their pitchforks and hunting rifles had to be welded into a real military force or the cause would be lost. Yes, rules and discipline had to be established. Officers had to dress according to rank, and their orders had to be carried out. March and drill practice would be increased. Work parties would be organized. Sanitation would be improved. Washington had wanted to make soldiers of his men, and under his leadership, the changes came quickly. Still, many problems remained, and the commander wasn't sure they could ever be solved. For one thing, all the discipline in the world couldn't combat the weather. Winter was coming, and soon it would turn bitterly cold. There were thousands of troops in Cambridge, badly dressed and poorly housed. The countryside had been stripped bare, and firewood was scarce. The army was short of blankets, soap, shoes, medical supplies, tools, muskets, and gunpowder. In August, Washington had been told that the arsenal held over 300 barrels of gunpowder. Later, when these figures were checked, it turned out that only 90 barrels were on hand, 
which meant that each man could fire his musket only eight or nine times before the powder was gone. What troubled the general even more was that he had no artillery. Several big siege guns hidden in Concord had been captured by the Redcoats. Now there were only a few small brass cannon that could fire six-pound shots. Compared to Howe's weapons, they were no better than pop guns. Sitting at his desk in this cold November day, General Washington worried about all this. Outwardly, he seemed calm, but his spirits were low. Picking up his quill pen, he continued the letter he'd begun to his friend Joseph Reed in Philadelphia. In it, he wrote, Could I have foreseen what I have and am like to experience, no consideration on earth would have induced me to accept this command. The general put down his pen, sealed the letter, and buttoned his coat. He stepped outside. From the top of Prospect Hill, the very spot where Will Knox had stood earlier, he could see Boston clearly. With his pocket telescope, he could make out the red jackets of Howe's Marines drilling on the common and patrolling Barton's Point. Like his British enemy, Washington needed a victory. On the land side, the rebels were in control, surrounding Boston in a huge ring from Roxbury to Chelsea on the Mystic River. In mine power, they far outnumbered the British, but the British had all the gunpowder and all the artillery. If the Patriots tried to drive them from Boston Harbor, Howe's warships could bombard the city, or by firing carcasses, thin shells filled with flaming oily rags, they could burn it to the ground. The forces were deadlocked. Without cannons, the colonists couldn't liberate Boston. Without men, the British couldn't attack Cambridge. Both sides had spies in Boston, and Washington knew that Howe was expecting reinforcements. Meanwhile, winter was here and smallpox was creeping through the big camp. Some of the volunteers, sick, bored, and lonesome for their families, were beginning to drift away. When the icy winds came with no victories to raise morale, the trickle of deserters would become a flood. Washington was afraid that his army, short of so many things, might fall apart, and with it, the whole precious cause. I can't tell you half I saw, they kept up such a smother, so I tipped my hat, made a bow, and scampered home to mother. Yankee Doodle, keep it up, Yankee Doodle Dandy. Mind the music and the step, and with the girls be handy. The squad, with its lone fifer, came straggling back to camp. Their cart held very little wood, since every tree, fence, and barn siding for miles around had already been fed to the campfires. Slowly, the general walked back to his quarters. At the rate the army used it, firewood would soon be worth more than gold. Of course, the men needed fuel to stay warm, but they also needed the fuel of success. His ragged soldiers needed a victory. Time was running out. Somehow, the Continental Army had to work a miracle. If they could defeat Howe and set Boston free, it would electrify the colonies. That would put heart into the rebellion before it was too late. Or was it too late already? General Washington wasn't sure. And we'll read Chapter 4 next time. Thanks so much for listening. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Love you guys. Bye-bye.